In the Gun, episode 108. I'm Skylar Callan. And wait, that's that's not Jed. That's that's uh, what happened. That's, that's Wesley Euler. What's <laughs> what's this guy doing on here on Hill Friday? That's all right. We got Jed is missing his first ever In the Gun episode. He actually brought this up at the end of the, uh, the preview the other day. 108 of these is the first one he's ever going to miss. Uh, we won't we won't hit knock him too hard for it, but Wes will pinch hit for us here today, here on Phil Friday. This episode of ITG always, as always, brought to you by our folk, our fine folks at Bet Online, where the game starts, and typically where we start here on this episode of uh, Phil Friday is we go back and look at how Jed and I did in our handicaps that we that we kind of create here in the ITG uh, sports book, and uh, we'll we'll do that. Today we're gonna Wes is gonna take us back Absolutely. and see how Chad and I did, and then at the end of the show, Wes and I will make our picks for West Virginia and UCF. So, Wes, tell me how bad I did. <laughs> Skyler, stoked to be here. Stoked to uh, catch up with you and Phil and uh, pinch hit or out of the bullpen or whatever World Series reference we want to yeah. use for Jed here. Right, shout out to our guy Ken Kendrick one more time in the Diamondbacks. Uh, so yes, this is where I will wear the role of Jed, albeit with a much fuller head of hair. I'm, 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 I'm sorry, Jed. I just had to. I'm wearing the hat today, though. I'm wearing the hat. Uh, picks from last week. The first thing that you and old Jedgar Allen Poe discussed was WVU rush yards over under. It was set at 185 and a half. Sky, you went under. Jed went over. The answer, WVU had 226 on the ground. And so the over hit and Jed got that one correct. Second thing you guys discuss and picked, will WVU run 45 times or more? Will Oklahoma State throw the ball 40 times or more? Both, neither, one or the other. You went with Oklahoma State throwing it 40-plus times. I think that would have been my pick as well, too. I like that pick by you. Jed went with neither, and unfortunately, once again, although maybe fortunate, like, is this the part where I brag? Like, oh, I'm 2-0, and oh, you're 0-2, yeah. because I'm Jed. Uh, but the answer was neither. Both were close. Oki State, 36 passes. WVU, 44 rush attempts right there, one away. But the answer was neither. And so Jed got that one correct. I got that one correct as well, too. And the final pick from last week, will the WVU-Oklahoma State game be decided by more than three and a half points or less than three and a half points? You guys both went less than three and a half. And so you both missed that one, obviously, as the Oklahoma State cow pokes came to Morgantown That's and won one. by and won by two scores. I mean, Skylar, I don't, you know, I'm no, uh, I'm no football expert like Jed. I didn't play in the NFL like Owen, but usually when you give up 28 points at home in the fourth quarter, that's not a recipe to win or lose a close no. football game. No, it's not. And, and I should have been smarter. Like even though I believed West Virginia, Oklahoma State would be a tight game, like. To, to have that game decided by three and a half points or everything over three and a half, I should have just taken it, it over. But that's that's just on me. The one thing I was really sh- surprised by was, I guess, for them rushing for 200-plus yards. Buddy. Because the way they, they threw the ball down in Houston, I just assumed, right? And they still threw the ball a little bit. But I was just assuming that they would kind of take them out of their element in the run game. Oklahoma State's done a really good job, as Jed laid out last week, against West Virginia in the run over the years. I just didn't see it being possible. But to run for over 200 yards and lose the game, it's a first under Neil Brown. Skyler, they were nine yards away from tying Barry Sanders' single-game rushing record at <laughs> Oklahoma State. Like – yeah, and, and from from what we saw from the deep, I think that's the most surprising part. You know what we saw from the defense that four game win streak, right? But really, kind of the Duquesne game excluded. Is is they're not a power five, they're not right. even a you know they're not even an FBS, they're an FCS. But that run of of uh, you hold Pitt to six points, you really limit Texas Tech, you really you know put the clamps down on TCU after what was a big first half for the Horn Frogs, right? That stat that Jed loved to bring up, they got one yard in the third quarter. <laughs> did TCU? Um, I think that's maybe been the most surprising part of this this two game losing streak is just after such a solid start to the season, even against Penn State, they did a lot of great things. And this defense has got to get back together and, and get that figured out before uh, before Central Florida tomorrow. Yes, they do. With, without if, a doubt. Well, partner, <laughs> if, if they <laughs> oh, if they if they don't, it's uh, it, obviously that can that can make West Virginia four and four on the season after a four one start. That would be. 
not very fun uh, for for all of us involved, including Neil Brown. So completely um, agree, completely so, agree. So yeah, we will uh, we'll get Phil's thoughts here coming up, right? Yep, yep. So we're gonna go and bring in Phil here in just a second. Uh, once again, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Toothman Ford. We all know cars cost less in Grafton, and by our friends at Fordis. Uh, for roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed, visit fortis.us.com. Hang tight. We'll be right around, or we'll be back right around the break here with Phil Steele to talk Big 12, Top 25, and West Virginia UCF. Nobody supports the Blue and Gold Mountaineers like Toothman Ford. With over 20 NIL deals and counting, Toothman Ford continues to rally behind our student athletes. And it's time we rally and support the dealer that supports the Mountaineers. Not only does Toothman Ford offer the best prices in the state on pre-owned, their never-over MSRP campaign on new Fords guaranteed to save you thousands. Drive with pride all season long, knowing you're supporting the dealer that fuels our Mountaineers. Toothman Ford, where cars cost less. In Grafton and at ToothmanFord.com. For more West Virginia Mountaineer football content, be sure to follow us on Twitter at In the Gun Podcast. All right, and we are back here with Phil Steele. You can get his stuff at Barnes and Noble and Books a Million. And Phil, it's it's been a, quite a couple of weeks here for the fine folks of West Virginia. After a four and one start, they've they've dropped a couple of games. They're kind of down on their hopes right now. And uh, but they've got a chance to bounce back against UCF this week. We'll talk about that. We'll get your thoughts later on here in the show. Uh, but Wes, go ahead and take it off. We'll, we'll get here yeah. started with the uh, top 25. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get to some Big 12 and some some WVU UCF thoughts, Phil, maybe um, the most exciting game from a national perspective of this weekend. You've got Oregon at Utah, eight at 13, a, uh, a top 15 tilt out there in the Pac-12, Utah coming off of that dramatic win against USC, obviously, at the Coliseum. Oregon kept things rolling with a, with a two-score victory over Washington State last week. This is an exciting one. How do you see this playing out? Yeah, and I think it's going to live up to the uh, potential that you, you think uh, that it will have here because Oregon is one of the best teams in the country. And, uh, you know, I found it interesting looking at some advanced lines uh, you know, Oregon hosts USC and Washington hosts uh, USC uh, later this year or later this uh, week or not Washington has to go add USC, but USC is basically regarded uh, or Oregon's regarded as one of the top teams in the country. And in my average game grades, uh, Oregon is actually still number one in the country. You look at their offense, they've got the powerful run game averaging 6.7 yards per carry. They've got Bo Nix, who's hitting nearly 80 percent of his passes. Uh, and defensively, they're holding opponents 87 yards per game below their season average. Now, the thing is, Utah is almost unbeatable at Rice Eccle Stadium. I think they've only lost uh, one home game in the last five years at Rice Eccles. Uh, they've had a lot of big wins there. They've beaten Oregon here a couple of times. Frankly, uh, you know, when I look at this game, I think it's going to come down to the wire, probably be decided by a field goal. And it surprises me a little bit that in Vegas right now, Oregon's a six and a half point favorite in this game. So, I mean, that, that line seems a little heavy. I think it's going to be a great game. I love the way that uh, Vaki has been running and receiving the uh, converted safety. He's still playing safety for him. Uh, I like the fact that Bryson Barnes now knows he is the starter on this team and did a good job leading that late drive against USC last week. So I think we're going to have a great game decided by a field goal. I'll take the Ducks by three in this one. Bill Pitt doesn't have very many wins on the season, but one of those wins did come against a quality opponent. That was against Louisville a couple of weeks ago. They got a chance to sit that sit on that loss and stew in it for a little bit. They come back. They're going to be hosting number 20 Duke this weekend. And I don't know what the status of Riley Leonard is. And that, that seems like a big question mark in this game and how it could turn out. Yeah, Louisville has is off that tough loss to Pitt, but uh, I think it's a really good situation for Louisville this week against Duke. Uh, when you when you look at Louisville, uh, even in the pit game, they had a 444 to 288 yard edge, a 28 to 13 first down edge. Uh, Jack Plummer's having a fine year, hitting 63 percent this year. They've got the run game with Jawar Jordan, and they've got the defense as well. And as you mentioned, I don't think Riley Leonard's going to play this week. If he does, he's not 100 percent. You know, once he went out in the second quarter or in the third quarter against Florida State last week. Uh, Duke only had 35 yards offense after that. So 
I think they really are a team that's on their second straight road game, taking on the Louisville team off a bye. I definitely like Louisville in this one to win it, probably about more than a touchdown. And, uh, you know, when you look at Duke this year, while their defense has been playing great, they gave up 422 to Clemson. They gave up 381 to Notre Dame. They gave up 420 to Florida State last week. I like Louisville by over a touchdown in this one. Phil, let's go down to SEC country in Georgia, Florida, right? One of the uh, one of the more storied rivalries in the history of the sport. Um, but you've got two programs that have been in, you know, in different places over the last couple of years. Obviously, Georgia has had their way in this one. You've got a Florida team playing better football since that kind of that embarrassment, that tough loss they took to Kentucky. They've won two straight since then. Any chance that the Gators uh, give give the Bulldogs some trouble here down in Jacksonville? Yeah, I think they will give him a game. Uh, you know, anytime you take away a, a Brock Bowers, who's been your key offensive player, you got to think the offense is going to struggle a little bit. And as you know, Florida, the amazing thing is, if you look at after that Kentucky game, you know, Billy Napier's under fire and can Florida win? Uh, a lot of people don't even realize Florida's five and two this year. You know, they actually have a pretty good record. Now they have lost two road games to Kentucky and Utah games they didn't fare well in. And it would concern me if Georgia's defense just tees off like they did against Kentucky a couple of weeks back. Uh, but I think when you look at Georgia, this is going to be a, a game where they learn how to run that offense without Brock Bowers, who's been their key offensive player. And I think Florida's got the offensive line and defensive line to keep this one closer than expected. I still have Georgia winning by 10, uh, 13 points in this game. I think they, they are the better team and get the win. Uh, but I, I think Florida keeps it closer than the Vegas odds makers expect. I believe the number right now, 14 and a half, yep. uh, that half point could turn out to be pretty valuable here. Bill, up to the Big Ten, Ohio State hitting the road to take on the Wisconsin Badgers. And over the years, Wisconsin's been known to kind of be a thorn in Ohio State's side, especially late in the year in Big Ten uh, title races. But uh, this is a different type of Wisconsin team with Luke Fickle at the helm. They're not a high-powered offense, but they're going to have to score some points uh, to be even able to have a chance in this one. Ohio State has not given up more than 17 points in a game this year. Does Wisconsin get over that mark, or do they get shut out down or shut down here once again? Yeah, and right now I've got Ohio State rated the number one defense in the country. They're holding opponents to 119 yeah. yards per game below their season average. They've held six of their seven opponents to season lows this year. That is a legitimate defense. But I like the situation for Wisconsin. Uh, go back to last week. Ryan Day was imploring the home crowd to be loud and uh, you know get fired up for Penn State. That was definitely their A game last week. And now it's a little bit of a letdown situation going on the road. You know, Wisconsin's got two losses. I don't think they're as fired up for Wisconsin as they were for Penn State last week at home. And the Badgers gained a little, some confidence with that last-minute comeback against Illinois. They've got Braylon Allen, who's having a hell of a year at running back. And while they lost Tanner Matt Mordecai, their uh, top quarterback uh, two weeks ago, Mordecai only had three touchdown passes on the season. Braden Locke, the Mississippi State transfer, had two touchdown passes last week. So I think this is a Wisconsin team that's going to give Ohio State a game. I like the Buckeyes to come out with the win, but I like Wisconsin to keep this one closer than expected. All right, there's uh, some of Phil's thoughts around some big games in the top 25. Let's go into the Big 12 now. The Sooners off of a, uh, a dramatic victory against UCF at home last week, Phil, where they needed a uh, two-point conversion stand there if you will to uh to keep that one from potentially going to overtime they head now to lawrence i think you know you mentioned florida a quiet five and two i think you could kind of say the same thing about kansas um is oklahoma ready for this one is this you know last trip to lawrence for for obviously the foreseeable future did they win comfortably or you think the jayhawks can can hang around and make the sooner sweat a little bit yeah, and if you take a look at the series history, uh, Oklahoma has won the last 18 games in this series. And believe it or not, every single win has been by double digits. So I like that wow. factor going in Oklahoma's favor this week. And then the other one would be, if you go back and look at that UCF game, uh, take a look at the first quarter of the game. UCF's first four drives, I believe they had one first down and three three and outs. Oklahoma, meanwhile, had three long drives, but they settled for two field goals and actually missed both of them. So they, they had the potential to be up big in that game after the first quarter. 
kept playing with their food a little bit, left UCF in the game, and, and UCF came back and, and, as you mentioned, almost bit them uh, with that two-point conversion at the end, which could have tied it. I, I like Oklahoma's defense. They're holding opponents to 66 yards per game below their season average. I'm not wild about Kansas's defense. In fact, uh, in Big 12 play, they're giving up 5.1 yards per carry. Each of the last three games, they've given up over 200 uh, yards rushing. So I think Oklahoma's going to be able to establish a run game, let Dylan Gabriel play loose and free. I don't think Jalen Daniels will play in this game. It should probably be Jason Bean once again. And with the series history, I like Oklahoma to win this one, as usual, by double digits. Bill, Houston has been involved in a couple of interesting endings over the last couple of weeks. Mm. Obviously, the Hail Mary. Dana Holgerson was not very happy with the officials toward the end of the Texas game. Um, but they fell short. They, they played better than I expected. Uh, they got Kansas State this week. He has really seen to kind of turn the corner and uh, has kind of re-entered themselves as a, a big piece of this Big 12 picture. How do you see this one playing out? Yeah, and that's that's another one where Texas jumped out to a 21 nothing lead, and you're thinking, okay, it's a walk in the park. Maybe they let up a little bit. Uh, and then Houston came back, played a really good game. In fact, they outgained Texas for the game. Like the way Donovan Smith is playing, he's got a 16-4 ratio. Uh, but uh, this is going to be a tough test for them because Kansas State is just dynamic at home. I mean, they are 8-1 and one against the spread as a home favorite. Last week, they took on a really good TCU team. And guess what? Their head coach, Chris Kleiman, was upset after the game because they didn't really have a great second half against TCU. They, they led 27-3 at the half. They won the game 41-3, and Kleiman's upset, said they didn't put them away <laughs> enough. So if Houston gets down 21-0 to Kansas State, I think K-State steps on their throat, much like they did against TCU. This is just a, a really strong Wildcat team at home. Uh, land under three touchdowns. I, I like Kansas State to win this one by over three touchdowns this week. And uh, I think they'll keep playing in the fourth quarter. And, you know, the other thing I like about K-State is since they've started adding Avery Johnson to the offensive QB, they've got two really good quarterbacks. I like the season Will Howard's having, but Avery Johnson gives you that dynamic run threat as well. So I, they've got a two-headed monster at QB. I like K-State to win this one by over three touchdowns. At the risk of sounding a little redundant, uh, another quiet five and two team, BYU. They head down to, to Austin to take on Texas for the uh, the one and done Big Twelve matchup between those two programs before the Longhorns are off to the SEC. Could this be a scary one for Texas, uh, Phil? You know, BYU. I know they've they've had some some good results, some good showings, some not so great showings as well too. Do you think they can go down there uh, and give Texas a game in Austin? Yeah, a surprising stat for you. The last five times these teams have met, uh, BYU's won four of them, and mm -hmm. including a win here in Texas, 40-21, to 21, the last time they traveled there in 2013. And Texas's lone win in the series has been by one. But watching BYU this year, they're sort of doing it with smoke and mirrors, aren't they? I mean, they are minus 160 yards per game in conference play, wow. and yet somehow have won two of those games. And against Arkansas, they were outgained by 143 yards, came out on top. For the season, they're minus 95 yards per game. They have no run game. They average 79 yards on the ground, just 2.8 yards per carry. And the defense is good, not great. They're giving up, they're letting opponents have 13 yards above their season average. Meanwhile, Texas, I think they may have learned their lesson, jumped out to that 21 0 lead last week against Houston, and then let them back in the game. So I, I, it was sort of a, a letdown spot coming off the Oklahoma game, coming off a bye. I think they'll be back to true form. Now, they don't have Quinn Ewers here. But I watched Malik Murphy the, this spring, and he looked great at QB. He's got the strongest arm on the team. He's a big boy, can throw it. Uh, and generally, when teams are without their starting quarterback, it's what I call the quarterback injury system. The running backs play harder. The offensive line plays harder. The defense plays harder. And uh, I think we're going to see Texas win this one very comfortably this week. BYU is, a, uh, in my mind, a smoke and mirrors 5-2 and two right now. Texas is a legitimate national title contender. I like Texas to win this one by over three touchdowns. Texas is in good shape in that quarterback room. They also got Arch Manning in there as the third quarterback, too. So, my goodness, huh. a good problem to have if you're the Longhorns. Uh, Iowa State at Baylor. How about this? Rocco Beck, the son of former West Virginia tight end Anthony Beck. He's got the Cyclones playing well. They're 3-1 and one in conference play. And I think after that uh, loss to Ohio on the road, everyone just kind of wrote this team off. Didn't expect much from them, but here they are. They're sitting at 3-1 and one in Big 12 conference play. 
They go on the road to Baylor this week, which is typically kind of a hard place to play, but Baylor's only two league wins are against the two worst teams in the Big 12 as it stands. Yeah, and I'm a little surprised that Baylor at home this year is just one and four. You would have expected them to have a better record. The Texas Tech game was very disappointing. But looking at the Texas Tech game a little bit closer, I mean, they lost 39-14, but the yards were pretty even. First downs were even. Texas Tech tacked on a couple of scores. The problem with Baylor in that game was they kept getting stopped down fourth down, giving Texas Tech a short field, and they paid the price for it. Now, last week they played a much better game against Cincinnati. But, of course, in Iowa State's last game, they sort of dominated Cincinnati on the road. So I do feel right now Iowa State is the better team coming in. But this is one of those circle the wagon games for Baylor. You know, they're coming off a bye or they're coming off the the win against Cincinnati. They're at home. They can't afford another loss. And I like the way that Blake Shapin's playing. Remember, Shapin missed a couple games earlier in the year. So, frankly, I can't make a pick on this game. I like both teams. I think both teams are going to finish the season strong. I'm going to flip a coin on this one. And uh, and, because Baylor's at home, Iowa State's a slightly better team. So I'm going to call it a coin flip game. Uh, I'm going to let you guys pick this one. Go ahead, pick this game for me. Oh gosh, I, I, I'm I with you. I'll your, go. Ba- I'll go. Ba- I'll go. Baylor at home. Yeah. I, I would. I would like to steal your phrase here, Phil, and call it a popcorn game. But I, I think <laughs> I, I would maybe. I think I'd maybe lean to Iowa State just because I can trust their defense. And and I don't know Blake Shape, and even though he hasn't thrown a pick this year, just has not played up to the expectations that we all thought he would. So. Awesome. There we awesome. Go. That, that is a popcorn game in my mind. I pre- I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Phil, last uh, last Big 12 one for you before we get to the Mountaineers and the Knights. Um, maybe a tale of two different teams here, right? Cincinnati, who's really struggled five straight losses uh, since that upset win at Pitt. Oklahoma State, who a lot of people, you know, I think myself included, were writing off after that South Alabama loss. They now have clawed back to a five and two record and have rattled off some wins here. Uh, Oklahoma state, keep that rolling. Any chance that Cincinnati can kind of get their first big 12 win and get back uh, in in feeling good and getting things moving in the right direction. How you see this one playing out between the Bearcats and the Cowboys. Well, as you guys recall uh, back for that Kansas state game, I said it was a circle of the wagons game. Oklahoma state's got a great shot. The upset, they got the upset the next week. I had them over Kansas and then last week, uh, I said it's going to be a down-to-the-wire game. And it, it was. It, it was a really good game, 27-27 in the fourth quarter. And then uh, Oklahoma State, uh, Ollie Gordon just got loose. That, and then, of course, that stopped on downs, turned things around. But this is a really good Oklahoma State team that's hitting their stride. They've got the schedule to make a lot of noise in the Big 12 this year. Now, I'm just going to keep riding the Cowboys. When you look at Cincinnati, I thought they were dominated at home two weeks ago by Iowa State. Uh, they have struggled this year, opening up 0-4 overall. Frankly, I'm surprised that Vegas actually has a number at Oklahoma State, seven and a half. I would have made it double digits in this one. They are tough at home. They are tough at night. I I like Oklahoma State to win this one comfortably. So here it is, West Virginia, UCF. The Mountaineers have lost two in a row. They are are reeling. Their backs are on the ropes. They got a tough game this week as UCF. It's their homecoming game. You, You expect a big crowd down there at the bounce house. They're looking for their first Big 12 win. You don't want to be the program that gives two teams their first Big 12 <laughs> win. They already did that. Uh, t- they've already given that that opportunity up to Houston. And the tackling, Phil, it has been atrocious for West Virginia these past two weeks. And that feels like it could be a problem again this week when you factor in UCF and all the speed that they have. Does West Virginia get back on track? And do we just look back at that Oklahoma State game? after this week and say, you know what, that was just a really good Oklahoma State team that's starting to find its stride and West Virginia gets back on track this week and and there's nothing to really panic about. Where where do you see this game between the Mountaineers and the Knights going? Yeah, and, you know, this one, the the Vegas line surprises me a little bit. The fact that UCF's a a touchdown favorite for the game because I actually feel West Virginia is a slightly better team. Now, UCF is tough at home, so I would have made the line maybe UCF minus three. But uh, being a seven-point favorite in the game does surprise me. So I like West Virginia plus the points, no doubt about it. And I do think it's going to be a high-scoring game. As you mentioned, West Virginia's had some problems tackling. John Rice Plumley is back. They have a lot of speed of, uh, on offense. They can score. But on the flip side of the coin, West Virginia's got a dynamic run game with Donaldson and Green. And you look at uh, what uh, UCF's allowing in Big 12 play this year. They're giving up 256 yards per game on the ground, 5.7 yards per carry. So I think West Virginia will be able to slow down that UCF 
offense be getting, you know, the fast pace offense because they'll be able to run the football and score as well. So I think it's going to be a higher scoring game. Uh, I think they're going to be trading punches all the way to the end, probably decided by a field goal. I think West Virginia's got an excellent shot at coming out of there with the win. And I definitely like the fact that they're uh, a full touchdown underdog in this one. Yeah, I do as well too, Phil. You know, I think there was a lot of that that chip on WVU's shoulder when the season started and, you know, being picked to finish last in the Big 12. You rattle off four straight wins. Maybe you start to to feel a little good about yourself and you lose some of that nastiness, some of that edge. Two straight losses now. Maybe maybe flip that in the other direction. Uh, last one I've got for you. You know, you, you mentioned WVU running the football and 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 being able to have success there. It does feel like you know, during that four-game win streak for the Mountaineers, the trenches on both sides of the football were a big part of that. They were able to run the ball. They were able to limit the opposition on the ground game and get after the opposition's quarterback as well, too. Do you see a, a distinct advantage for either team in the trenches on this one when you look at O-line, D-line? Could, could that be an X factor Saturday afternoon? Well, I definitely like West Virginia's offensive line versus Central Florida's defensive line. I think that's their biggest edge in the game, and it's one that should help. Now, since Lathan went out at linebacker, I haven't seen the front seven be as dominant as it was earlier in the year. So that is a little bit of a concern because UCF can run the ball. I don't see West Virginia having the advantage there, but I don't think their disadvantage defensive line versus offensive line is as much as West Virginia's advantage is offensive line versus defensive line. Yeah, Phil. Well, if you don't know, we're we're a little stitious around here. Not superstitious, but just a little <laughs> stitious. So if, if Jed for so if for some reason the Mountaineers get back on track this week and put up a hundred points, uh Jed's gonna be officially kicked off this show. So <laughs> 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 you'll no longer be talking to Jed on Fridays. But uh we thank you so much for joining us again this week. It's always a blast, and we'll we'll be chatting next week, hopefully after Mountaineer win. You can't be a football fan if you're not superstitious. I'll tell you that much. That's right. And that's uh, right. a lot of lot, lot of fun talking to you guys, as always. Uh, really enjoy my Thursdays with you guys. Thanks, Phil. Yes, Phil. Thank you so much. We'll be right back here on In the Gun. We're going to make our picks here for West Virginia UCF in the ITG Sportsbook segment here of the week. So hang tight. We'll be right back. For nearly 20 years, Fortis has been the nation's leader in providing guaranteed roof performance programs for commercial buildings. Fortis offers roof performance solutions that feature extensive initial and ongoing reconditioning for commercial buildings as an alternative to traditional replacement with long-term performance guarantees that are backed by global leader Lloyds of London. Fortis offers a comprehensive range of roof performance management programs that provide financial security, extend the life of our customers' roofs, and make a significant impact on ROI. Fortis is currently improving performance and increasing ROI for customers at more than 4,800 locations with more than 140 million square feet protected, including many Fortune 500 companies that have turned to Fortis to save money, gain financial certainty, and extend the life of their existing roofs. Fortis has helped customers save more than $520 million in capital roof replacement costs for an average ROI of over 250%. To learn more, visit fortis.us.com. Fortis, roof performance and financial certainty guaranteed. All right, so that was fun as always with Phil Steele. Uh, Wes, always, um, always a good time uh, to, to hear from the best in college football. Your first time to hear from uh, Skyler. So. I was going to say, I mean, you know what they say, you never forget your first time. And uh, yeah, I listen, I don't care if you're our age, right? I mean, you're in your correct. 20s, correct? Yep. I'm correct on that, right? I'm 32, so my early 30s. You know, Owen is a little bit older than me. Jed is obviously the more seasoned one on this podcast. I, I don't care what age group you are. If you're a college football junkie, I think you always got to love hearing from Phil Steele. Just the knowledge that that guy has from top to bottom is incredible. He's so prepared. He's so well-versed. And yeah, so that was a lot of fun. I will never forget my first time catching up with Phil Steele here on the podcast. Yeah, I mean, it's it's insane every week how he pegs these things. Jed and, just, Jed and I just sit back and laugh at this. because I mean, gotta be, we, He's got to be in those meeting rooms in Vegas, right? When they're yeah. picking the spreads. It's like, it's like he's tapped into that. He's got to be. And when I think he's in, in the same meeting rooms with Jed when we, we do these picks at the end of the show, because I'm That's not right. doing anything in these things. I think I, I've not hit a pick in the last three weeks. So, oh, geez. Well, maybe I'm uh, your Wes, good luck, give me, Yeah. Wes, give me, I'm going to a different sports book this week. So, Wes, tell me, tell me what we're picking this week. All right. We got three questions again uh, to pick 
that I will stand in for Jed. And if I do well, maybe I'll have to pop into the episode next week and talk some trash. If I do poorly, I'll just have to disappear and pretend this never happened. And it was just artificial intelligence doing my voice and what was actually Jed. The first one here, Garrett Green has averaged over the last two games a combined 402 yards of total offense between his rushing and his passing. Dang, that's impressive when you read it out loud. It is. Central Florida, UCF, has held four Big 12 starting quarterbacks they've faced so far to an average of just 239 total yards on the ground and in the air between the passing and the run game. So question number one for you, Sky, will Garrett Green finish the day over under 275 combined yards in the air and on the ground. I when I saw this initially, I thought it was going to be like 290, 295. So for that alone, I guess I'll just go with the over. I think he's he, they're starting to find some rhythm with this passing game, and especially downfield, like EJ Horton, Devin Carter, they're starting to come to life a little bit. Uh, Cole Taylor seems like he's ready for a bounce back game. So. I think he could get 260 or so through the air. And if he can do that, I have no concern whatsoever that he can get another 30 uh, on the ground, which he wouldn't even need that much. But, yeah, I, I'm going to take the over here. I think so, too. This is – listen, I'll admit this is one of those that has the too good to be true right. type feel a little to little it. fishy about this one. And, again, Vegas always knows. But, yeah. I mean, if I'm – you know, Garrett, Garrett went over 100 yards on the ground last week. I mean, if he goes for 70 – on the yeah. ground, 75 on the ground this week, and 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 then 200-some through the air. Yeah, listen, I'm going to go over as well, too, and I'm going to caveat this right now. If he doesn't go over, I don't know how That's we win problems. this. I don't know how we win this. I mean, unless we're winning another 17-6 type slugfest yeah. like we did against Pitt, and I just don't see that happening, that's a problem. So he's, I'm gonna he's go the up. offense right now. I'm going to go over because he's the offense right now. I'm going to go over because I at least want to live in in cautious optimism and perpetual hope here for the next 24 hours or so before this game gets going. So, yeah, give me over. We'll both go with the over. Garrett Green to finish with more than 275 combined passing and rushing yards. Question number two here, Mr. Callahan. Since that was a Garrett Green question, we'll omit him from this one. Which of these two Floridians will score a touchdown in his return trip to the Sunshine State? C.J. Donaldson, of course, from Miami. Traylon Ray from Tallahassee. Or option C, both. Option D, neither. Now, this is an interesting one. This is a tough one because C.J. hasn't really ran the ball well over the last couple of games. He's really he's really got to get on, on track here for West Virginia. Traylon Ray has has shown some flashes here and there. You, you just feel like at some point during the last latter half of the season, he's going to start to really burst through and and kind of make his presence known. But I'm going to go. I'm going to go CJ um, because I, quite frankly, I think they need him to get into the end zone more than once. Yeah, it's, you know it's funny you say that. That was my oh, that was my same exact thought process was. They just need CJ to score. That means the yeah. run game's probably having success, right? That means that they're probably getting down into the red zone and having one of those eight, nine, 10, 11 play drives that ends with CJ punching it in, you know, from, from three or four yards away, something like that. And I think they need that to happen. I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm going to go with neither. As much as I hate as much as I hate doing it, I'm gonna go with neither. I think this is gonna be another heavy Garrett Green game. I think he'll have a rushing touchdown. I think he'll have two passing touchdowns. Uh one of those is going to Devin Carter, so that takes one off the board. I just I would really like to pick Traylon Ray. I I I, I don't like what's going on with CJ and, to, and and listen, I'm not saying that he's not gonna do anything or, right. or, or anything like that, that I'm expecting him to completely fall off a cliff. I just until I see him get back in that end zone, I'm gonna Hold, I'm not going to hold my breath and here. Traylon, and Traylon's just – he doesn't get enough targets for me to take that that's, chance. And that could change. That could certainly yeah. change on Saturday, but but that's why – I'm going to go with neither. As much as I don't want to go with neither, I think Garrett Green gets a rushing touchdown. Garrett Green throws for two touchdown passes as well too. Um, and you know what? Maybe let's get a pick six in there as well, Ooh. a little defensive touchdown okay. if I'm going to call my shots. Four touchdowns for the Mountaineers on Saturday, but I don't think either of those two, unfortunately – are going to be uh, finding the back of the end zone. Although, of course, I hope that I am wrong. All right, Skylar, we got just uh, a couple minutes left in this one. Final question here that our uh, our guy Jed has picked. 
Question number three, a defensive question about a few former uh, Florida high school standouts here on the other side of the football. Which one of these things happens? A, Aubrey Burks from Oak Ridge, Florida, intercepts a pass. Uh, Davion Hawkins from Lauder Hill, Florida, records a TFL. Jacoby Spells from Fort Lauderdale records two tackles, two or more tackles. Or C, the catch-all answer, either all of the above or none of the above happen. So this is an interesting one, the way that, 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 that Jed, uh, the way that Jed worded this. Yeah, I, I, I almost went with none because Jacoby Spells really hasn't played a ton. He's playing more as the season goes on. Aubrey Burks right. hasn't, didn't play great last week. Right. Uh, Hawkins, eh, maybe. I, I'm going to go with Hawkins, I guess. Um, they, they need to get more TFLs. They need to create more negative plays. I don't know who it's going to come from. I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say Day-Day Hawkins gets in the backfield. It's funny. That was the first one I thought, too. You know, while the quarterback pressures and sacks and hurries haven't been what they've needed to be for the Mountaineers, they're still getting a few TFL. I think they had four total TFLs, Yeah, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, against Oklahoma State. So that does seem to be the, you know, if I'm if I'm betting with my head here, that would be the answer. I'm going to try and speak one into existence here again, kind of like we did with Garrett Green, though. I'm going to go Aubrey Burks because I agree with you. Um, you know, he missed. Or, or yeah, right. Had the no, sorry, had the had the injury against Houston, right? Am I correct in that? Or no, sorry, injury was against TCU. TCU missed, yeah. missed Houston and then didn't play his best against Oklahoma State. So, you know, he gets hurt, he has some time off, he comes back in against a good Oklahoma State offense. I, I think it was understandable why he struggled a little bit last weekend. Uh I know you know Jed and I talked about this on the preview episode though. When you're reeling a little bit as a team, what you need is you need your best players to put in their best performances. You don't need some yeah. unknown guy to step up and come out of nowhere. That's great, but what's more realistic is your best players playing at an A level, and they need that this week, particularly on defense. They need Beanie, Beanie Bishop, Sean Martin, Lee Coba. They need those guys to put in A-type performances. They also need that from Aubrey Barks. I think after missing a game and not having his best performance, he bounces back. So I will go with A, Aubrey Burks intercepts a pass against UCF, speaking it into existence, baby. <laughs> and again, if you didn't hear Wes at the beginning of this, if all of these picks are right, these are his picks. If right. not, we're, we're going to just throw it towards Jed. And if his not, record, we're going to so. laugh at Jed and say, what were you <laughs> thinking last week? Buddy? Exactly. Come on, pal. So anyways, uh, that'll do this it for been, us This here has today. been fun. Thanks for having yeah. me, man. Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and Wes and I, we've been talking uh, off air about maybe doing some basketball stuff this upcoming season. We haven't really nailed those plans down yet, just yet, but uh, keep an eye out for that. We'll, we'll talk about that here as the season gets closer, which is technically next week, but we'll, ten, we'll, we'll, ten we'll days away, nine out. days yeah. away, something like that. Yeah. So uh, anyways, thank you guys for watching Phil Steel Friday here on In The Gun. If you haven't yet, I don't know what you're doing, but go to YouTube and hit that subscribe button. Hit uh, In The Gun Podcast. Also on Twitter at In The Gun Podcast. We've got the preview up. You can go as far back as to the Big Daddy episode kicking off UCF where we really talked about Oklahoma State. And uh, Wednesday, we made our Big 12 picks for the week. So make sure you sign up, compete against us, have a chance to win that autographed Owen Schmidt rookie card. Uh, we're still looking for that first guy to go for four, four, or gap that could go four for four. So thank you guys for watching, and we'll be back next week to talk with Big Daddy here on In the Gun.